Good afternoon, Cloud Native community, and welcome back to Salt Lake City, Utah. My name is Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be joined with Rob Streche for another power-packed week with the open source community. It's already been really good. I'm excited for our next guest, too. I am, too, and I, I think, again, this is a topic that as Kubernetes evolves and as Cloud Native evolves, it's pretty critical to bring things together. And this is one of the key places, I think, that bringing workloads in as we build apps, that this, this uh, next topic is really core to that happening. Yes, absolutely, and, and on that note, Ju and Mike, welcome. Thanks. Welcome Thank to you. Great to see you back, Mike. Yeah. First time, very excited to have you with us. Mike, I know you were at the Commons keynote yesterday. So many events, you've already had a busy week and here we are on day one, right. very impressive. Yeah. Give us a little overview of what you were talking about. So day zero events, Commons, we have a couple hundred people that normally come with the co-located one with KubeCon. And yesterday was all about AI, virtualization, security, and how those workloads are transforming the platform in new ways. So it was great to see a lot of customers show up and a lot of um, interest. Yeah, and I, I think one of those topics is kind of one, where I was going with this, which is virtualization. You guys have already announced OpenShift virtualization, and it cam comes out for the upstream, which is Kubevert. Tell us a little bit more about where you're seeing this playing and how it's really disrupting things from yeah. uh, a cloud perspective. It's really been an interesting journey because, so the Kubert, the project itself, I think came out around 2016. And then we GA the technology and our product in 2020. From 2020 to about 2023, it was literally just modernization. And what, when I say modernization, a lot of people think that I'm talking about moving VMs to containers. Totally not talking about that. It's working with a VM as if it is a container. So, um, you, you, know, I, you know, declarative nature, GitOps with the config files, uh, not baking in the IP address, allowing the VM to move across the cluster without being tied to a certain area, like all these cloud native patterns being applied to a virtual machine. That's where we were. And then, almost overnight in 2023 into the, I remember it was March of 2024, the customer base just wanted to migrate. They didn't want to talk about modernization, they wanted to talk about getting off their legacy virtualization platform as quickly as possible. And it um, changed everything we were doing at the beginning of the year. It really made us focus on putting features into the product. You, can you think of some of the features we put in around this time to, to help oh, yeah. accelerate that? Recently we added a whole bunch of features for um, OpenShift virtualization, things like, um, um, oh, memory over subscriptions, so you can have higher density for your workloads, or VM workloads in particular. Um, we also have memory hot plugs, so you can have vertical scaling. Um, we've also done, also on the migration front, some good work around static IP preservation and drive letters, so if you're migrating from, say, Windows, um, it, it's a great onboarding uh, to get onto OpenShift virtualization. And even from a storage perspective, we've done things like storage live migration for um, actually moving between storage classes. So if you want to offer different storage tiers, you'd be able to do that very easily. So those are just some of the neat things that we've introduced recently. Yeah, explosive. I mean, I, yeah. I was on stage in May with Sirius XM talking about their migration journey and what they went through and, and how they were successful moving forward. That's an exciting yeah. customer example. Yeah. <laughs> Any other exciting customer examples like that you want to share right now? Like Goldman, right? Yeah, Gold yeah it was in Paris it, yeah. uh, at the last yeah. KubeCon that uh, talking about Kubert and their use of the, the solution. So yeah, lots of big names out there, lots of uh, success. That's yeah. exciting. Zhu, you mentioned, uh, well, a lot of exciting features that you all have added, but I'm curious, I can imagine people are asking you all for a lot. You have a lot of conversations given the scale and scope and industries that you touch. How do you prioritize what you're building right now, particularly particularly in this modernization phase that you're talking about? Well, that's a really good question. A lot of it's going to be dependent on what we are hearing from our customers. Right now, a lot of them are feeling that disruption in the industry especially, and so where they're asking for help is to actually, believe it or not, to simplify that experience because they're coming from another vendor where it offers a different experience, has a lot of uh, bells and whistles on it, so they're looking for similar type features on OpenShift virtualization or actually just smoothing, smoothening it out so that it's a 
uh, better user experience, if you will. Also the migration tooling to simplify how you actually migrate. Um, we're also looking to offer this on the hybrid cloud, obviously. So today we offer OpenShift virtualization on bare metal on AWS. Uh, we also recently added it to our managed um, Red Hat OpenShift on AWS service, but we're looking to roll this out on more platforms and the other major cloud providers and so on. We're looking at networking. I can go on all day long, but this, probably no, we're no, but this is out fascinating. No, no, not so. at all. I mean, it, it, well, it's, it's hang out there just for a second because yeah. you were on a roll. So. You, I, Continue to tell me what you're evaluating, because I mean you've got to be evaluating everything. Your Red Hat, right? You could, you know, you could almost build infinite things. So that focus and prioritization has got to be a real struggle. I think a lot of it is focusing Healthy on struggle. the sort of key use cases that customers are looking to solve. I think um, expanding into new use cases, new markets. Some of the areas we're looking at are even smaller footprints, like edge or Ooh, yeah. robo type situations where. Um, they have very small footprints or uh, smaller locations or maybe they might have smaller budgets as well. So things like uh, two node uh, control plane type clusters for actually offering the ability to run OpenShift virtualization on it. Um, so we go all the way from the very largest scales all the way to the smallest scales for the smallest remote retail or point of sales type uh, locations, if you will. So those are just some examples. Yeah. And, oh, and cool. I think, again, there's some of these also tie into things like security, right? right? Because security has to be at the heart of this. To your point, if they're coming from another platform where they've had decades of you know, building up that ecosystem around that, and yeah. security has to be top of mind when you're looking it at has. this so, as well. So security, it, along with virtualization, it, it can't always be about virtualization. Um, security really exploded this year in terms of compliance standards. Uh, regulatory assignments in different vertical markets, and especially out of Europe, we just saw an explosion of, um, I don't even know what, what to call them, but there's a lot of them out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, uh, and they, they want to see isolation in new places in the platform, so typically we would isolate in Kubernetes at the namespace or at the cluster boundary. So we had to make that very inexpensive and automate it for people to make that choice between a cluster boundary or a namespace boundary. Um, then we open the door to furthering the isolation down to the network level for the first time. So giving people their own CIDR ranges. I don't know if you want to talk at all about the uh, user-defined networks that we're putting in. Yeah, we just introduced user-defined networks in our recent release, and so this is the notion of actually building uh, greater isolation to be able to en enable, say, tenants to actually even have uh, overlapping IPs or CIDR ranges so that it's uh, separated, but um, uh, dedicated, let's say, to a particular tenant. So these are some of the new things that we're doing, um, not just for OpenShift virtualization, but uh, greater freedom and flexibility and control for customers, obviously. Yeah, yeah and, and this helps across different industries, and one of the ones you're, you were looking for is Dora. Yes. Not the Explorer, <laughs> but the <laughs> EU regulation, because yeah. it's one of my favorite ones. It talks about a lot of the compliance and how you have to be able to be recoverable yeah. and things of that nature. That has to play a lot into where you guys focus from a product perspective because it's not just about virtualization, it's the security, but it's also people modernizing their apps and wanting to modernize their apps. Yeah. What, what are you seeing people doing differently this year? Because you talked about it yeah. where in March, hey, kind of, you know, I, I want to get off this platform, maybe somebody's pricing model changed or something like that and they felt the impetus to go. Yeah. What are you seeing from an app modernization thing? Because that, that really was the core of where you guys were at. Right, and so app, app mod is what we abbreviated to, um, is the bread and butter of OpenShift. It is by far the largest use case that we solve for our customers. And it could be something as simple as putting a strangler pattern around an existing large monolith to give somebody a new customer experience with that technology, hit that new API, have that new experience pulling from a, a sort of a legacy solution. Um, that was very popular this year. Uh, I would say event-driven API topologies, like fragmenting out and having a lot of different pieces that are allowed to innovate at different rates and then come together at a, at a deployment. Um, very popular. Uh, we have a lot of people moving from uh, legacy Java to lightweight Java, uh, Quarkus. Um, 
just a lot of those traditional patterns are where we help most of our customers use the platform. I don't know if you want to talk about the uh, migration toolkit at all. That, that was pretty special this year. Yeah, so there's some neat things we're doing. Um, for example, Gen AI is really hot. Um, within the conveyor community, which is around uh, tooling that's focused for migration. Um, there's some neat innovations that's going on. Uh, for example, there's a project called Conveyor AI or Kai, and this is something where it's sort of AI enabled to actually help you with um, looking at your source code and actually figuring out how best to modernize it and taking the combination of LLMs and actually uh, taking some of the conveyor source data to actually do some static code analysis to actually provide some guidance on sort of past experience and applying it um, with that specialized knowledge from the RAG and all the wonderful things that the AI world brings to actually help guide that solution and actually streamline and automate it. So these are just some examples, but obviously we're taking a lot of the conveyor investments that we're making and uh, bringing that into our migration tooling. Um, so we have you know, things at the application containers, uh, VM level, so everything to sort of make it easier for customers to migrate and take advantage of our platform, obviously. So by, by migrate, kind of explain what you mean that there, because I mean, that's, that's a big term, it's right? It's a very big term. It's any, anywhere from analyzing, assessing, um, figuring out whether it's a right fit or not, all the way to actually providing tooling to actually guide you to actually migrate or even doing like move to cube as an example. So um, like I said, it covers the whole gamut. An example might be to interrogate a JAR file, look at the Java class that are being called, and then see if that is going to work in Quarkus, for example, right. without you needing to do anything. Yeah, you're not ta just talking about the instance or the container, you're, you're, or, or the VM for that matter, you're looking all the way into the application yes. to help people understand using some of the up, up you know, up, uh, up top, I'm losing my, my brain here, but. We're at altitude, for the record, right folks, we are at right at, right out of It's a little <laughs> less oxygen, there's an oxygen bar actually around the corner if you yes, need to hit it up but at but lunchtime. It's Looking a lot at the of the coach. upstream, <laughs> upstream is what I meant. Yeah. Okay, and, upstream, yeah. it's and, buying and, you a little time and I guess, talk, talk to how you're working with some of these upstream communities, because I'm mean, Red Hat's, I, I think one of the second, second most, I didn't look this morning, second most or first most no. PRs you know, contributing back into the community. How does that work with all of this as well? So we're, we're upstream first, and that's a lot of work, because um, our, our engineers almost have to carry two job responsibilities. They have to go into the upstream community, they have to work in that community, be a successful maintainer, and then also come back to us and bring that code in and make sure it's enterprise ready. Make sure it's ready to be CVE patched, kept up to date, it fits our integration with our larger ecosystem of partners and all of our data center integrations. So it's, a, it's almost like we're asking them to do two jobs. Uh, we don't pay them twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, what are you, it's a big week for you, you're probably having a lot of conversations, I bet everyone's excited about tooling. What gets you most excited well, I'm going to have a couple questions about this, but what gets you most excited about where we're going? It feels like a bit of an inflection point. 10 years of Kubernetes, AI adoption, I mean, AI actually probably catalyzing a significant amount of Kubernetes adoption. So many things going on right now. I feel like tech is cool again, nerds are cool again. So what do you think we're going to see in, I mean, we were always cool, Rob, I see you over there giggling. <laughs> what do you hope we're going to see in the next few years? Doesn't need to be next year specifically, yeah. but what do you think we're going to see that's, that's going to be kind of radically interesting across the board? Yeah. Well, I think right now is a really good time to ask that question and look at what we're doing in the platform. Thanks. A platform is completely worthless without workloads. Like you don't build a platform yeah. to have no workloads in it. And so when you start putting workloads in the platform, it's got this weird relationship where the workloads will force the platform to evolve and do new things. And so when you're sitting there thinking, should the platform do this before you go and you know, put the money down to do that engineering work, um, 
when you take a step back and when you time travel into the future and you look back on that as the time is washed over you on uh, whether or not that was a good choice, it becomes an obvious choice. It's like how could we have not seen that this had to be done in the platform when we were questioning it, right? And as we go into 2025, we're experiencing a lot of that with the new AI workloads. So the AI workloads are bringing in a tremendous amount of innovation in the platform because they're not simple web-based apps. They're not like these vertically scalable, horizontally things. They're batch, HPC, they're specialized hardware devices. There's a gambit of things they bring in. I don't know if you want to talk about some of the projects that it's causing. Yeah, um, I know um, to Mike's point, AI is really hot. Um, Gen AI is <laughs> also it? really I hot. I haven't heard that yet today. I, I know. <laughs> What's that acronym mean? Yeah. Okay. Um, in the keynote, they talked a lot about Gen AI, and I know last year and uh, going forward, we're invested heavily also in Gen AI. Um, we've got something we released last year, or announced, I should say, yeah. uh, still on its uh, way to being released, um, is uh, Lightspeed uh, throughout the Red Hat portfolio. So we've done, also from an OpenShift perspective, we've recently introduced um, Lightspeed and Tech Preview with some great um, capabilities, including supporting our own granite models. So obviously open source. and. Um, it works really well in disconnected environments, so we're looking forward to hearing more and more customers adopt that. Um, so that's one example, but some of the other areas that we're doing work on the upstream are things like dynamic resource allocation or DRA, Q. I mean, these are taking advantage of GPUs or um, making sure our core APIs are aligned with uh, the AI ML workloads of tomorrow. And so th these are just some examples, and there's obviously more that's going on. And uh, beyond just sort of the higher level Kubernetes abstractions, we're also having to do all that hardware enablement to make sure that uh, it's compatible all the way up our stack, and we're able to leverage and expose the features through all of the components that we have, um, notwithstanding. Um, we also have to worry about security. That's uh, you know our bread and butter, if you will. Uh, we've got to make sure that those uh, workloads are isolated, are not going to impact you know, some other tenant, for example. So a lot of interesting innovations that we're driving in that space, and we'll continue to do so going forward. What an exciting time. Wow, okay. One last question for you, because we were talking about it before we went live. When we're in London for KubeCon, what do you hope to be able to say then that you can't yet say today? It's a good question. Yeah, I think it's, it'll probably be related to, we, we made an acquisition recently, I mean, oh, you yeah. may have heard the other day. It'll probably be related to bringing in a very end-to-end -end experience on how to bring smaller large language models into your data center to touch your most intimate data you don't want to show anybody and having a huge movement and experience around that as you, as you sell it to your customers. And I think that, that'll be a big thing next year. Love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah I, I, loved, I loved that acquisition, by the way, and if people haven't seen it, there was a great discussion. I got to be on the analyst review of it yesterday morning, which was fantastic about, because we see that as well, small language models and things coming and going to the edge, which you were talking about, and disconnected too. But what do you yeah. hope to see in the next six months here? I think it's a lot of what we're seeing today, but I think what you're going to see is a lot of smaller uh, models out there. I think we're going to start to see more of it at the edge. Um, a lot of what we're talking about is more in the core, it's really large, it requires a lot of GPUs, but we're starting to also hear about people saying, hey, I want to start doing it, fine tuning at the edge on really, really uh, constraint devices, let's just say, and some of them in obscure regions of the world, let's just say. Um, but I, I think a lot of what we see will just be sort of exploding in a lot of different segments, a lot of different industries, and I think it's just really exciting times that we live in today. It really is, what, an, what a fabulous note to conclude this on. Shu, you rocked it your first time. You better not be good nervous job. when we have you on next show. <laughs> you, you, you've used your nervous past, because that was too good. So many great sound bites, and Mike, pleasure to have you on the show again as well. Rob, always a joy. 
I'm excited about the future. I am too. Yeah, and I hope all of you are excited about the future, wherever you might be tuning in to our fabulous three days of coverage here in Salt Lake City, Utah. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.